Sunday school. <clears throat> Good to see Brother Jesse and Sister here this morning. Brother Bruce. Brother Blaine. Participate. 
David laughed. Declamation and persuasive speaking co competitions. While returning from the competition at the university, <coughs> the Interscholastic League, he met a junior named Carolyn, who in invited him to her church. Roy's visit to the Pentecost church was nearly his last. Numerous things stood out to Roy. The church was Pastor Don Woman. The people were extremely demonstrative, and the music was loud. These all made Roy uncomfortable because they were quite unlike what he thought church was supposed to be. He did not plan to return, but in Roy's own words, something got a hold of me. Sound like Ray Stevens on a check to the Pastor Roy or Pastor Ray. Roy attended college in Austin, Texas, and Carolyn helped him locate a church. In his continued journey of faith, but nothing more so than his intense study of the Bible. Through prayer and study, God revealed to Roy his need to be baptized in Jesus' name. Then during revival services, Roy received the Holy Ghost. Roy never imagined the impact the Holy Ghost would have on his life. He responded to a call to preach. We grew from his aerospace engineering program and within four years started a new church plan. Many challenges arose, but Roy did not allow himself to be stagnant. He persisted in opening himself to God's will and choosing an unbroken relationship with Jesus. Roy Moss, pastor in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, for 46 years. Truth Tabernacle, United Pentecostal Church, is still a thriving church today because the Lord reached for Roy and he responded. Praise God. To the angel of the church, the led the seal. I know that works. You are neither hot nor cold. I will spew you out of my mouth. The Lord wants us to serve him with our whole heart. You say I am rich and need nothing. You do not realize your true condition. God called them to turn to him. The Lord wants to be the source we turn to for everything. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Hear my voice and open the door. Enjoy fellowship with the Lord. We must open the door of our lives and choose unbroken fellowship with Jesus. According to Yahoo News Singapore, on September 15, 2017, a man was sentenced to 70 weeks in jail for cheating pawn shops. Five other similar charges were also taken into consideration. Court documents show the convicted man had been approached by a nightclub owner with enough opportunity to make some extra cash. The plan was simple. The nightclub owner had some gold bars he wanted the man to help him pawn for a 20% commission. The con was that each gold bar had only cost $900, but could easily be sold for much more. Why? Because the gold bars closely resembled undetected for most people the current mint in Australia. However, each bar was only 50% gold. Because the pawn shops were less discerning than real gold traders, the man was able to successfully pawn a few bars off as if they were 99% gold. He subsequently uh, found other pawn shops to swim. It is estimated that he eventually cheated pawn shops out of $42,900. What a sinking feeling it must have been to the pawn shop owners when they discovered they had been conned. 
The enemy of our soul lately comes Christians by getting them to buy into religion rather than a genuine, sold out relationship with Jesus Christ. To the angel of the church of Laodicea, in the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation, Jesus asked John to deliver special words to seven churches in Asia Minor. One of the strongest admonitions given to any of the churches was given to the church of Laodicea. It serves as a clear indication as to how God feels about religion, which is marked by spiritual pride and apathy. After reminding the church of Laodicea of his power and faithfulness, he gave them a very specific message in verses 15 and 22 in Revelation. As in some of the previous churches, the Lord adapted his words to something significant about the city in which the assembly was located. In this case, Laodicea was known for its wealth and its manufacturing of a special eyesight, as well as a glossy black wool cloth. Laodicea was also located near Hierapolis, famous for its hot springs in Colossae, which was known for its pure, cold water. I know thy works. In verse 15, the Lord began by reminding them he knows not only the minds and the thoughts of people, but he also knows their hearts. Because of this, God is the only one qualified to judge anyone. We cannot rely on achievements or accumulation of wealth for affirmation. Even one's heart cannot be trusted. Jeremiah 17, 9. Only God knows a person's true works and can be a true believer. He or she must be spiritually vulnerable and sensitive to him. Both history and scripture warn that people have the tendency to reduce Christianity to a set of rules, rituals, or ideals instead of embracing a dynamic, heartfelt relationship with God. Even well-meaning believers can fall prey to reducing the Christian faith to a religion. A.W. Tozer put it this way, Everywhere among conservatives, we find persons who are biblical taught, but not spiritual taught. They can see truth to be something they can grasp with the mind. There is no truth apart from the spirit. The most brilliant intellect may be embezzled when confronted with the mysteries of God. <laughs> Can you describe a time when God spoke to your heart through his word or through a sermon, a book, or a song? You are neither hot nor cold. In Revelation 3, 15 through 16, God made it clear he is looking for people with a passion for him. Yes, yes. Apathy disqualifies people from being true Christians. Most people identify with an aversion to, limp hands, to, to a limp handshake, a passionate, passionless kiss, an empty promise, or a half-hearted commitment. They are, they are as pleasant as lukewarm coffee or room temperature ice cream. Lukewarm faith offends God because it reveals one's true feelings. I will spew you out of, out of my mouth. To make sure his point was crystal clear, God declared, So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That's Revelation 3 and 16. While this may sound like harsh language, one must remember our relationship with God is eternal. Yes. No relationship is more important. Our relationship with God has no room for ambiguity or compromise. Scripture refers to the church as the bride of Christ. As a part of that bride, individual believers are called upon to commit to God 
as dramatically as a bride commits to her husband. With that in mind, consider the following scenario. A 20-something woman who just said yes to her boyfriend's request to her hand in marriage is dining with him at a seaside restaurant. Both of them are filled with anticipation and wonder as they discuss wedding plans and their dreams for the future. After lunch and a shared ice cream cone, they stroll down the boardwalk, pausing at, at, at a seating to enjoy the ocean view. In a moment of passion, she grasps her fiance's hand, pulls him close and stands on her tiptoes in a flavored invitation for him to kiss her. To her dismay, her fiancé quickly steps backwards, whispering, honey, not here. Everyone is watching. <laughs> Giving him the benefit of the doubt, she smiles and tries to enjoy their continued conversation. A few minutes later, as they resume their walk, she re reaches for his hand, only to have him recall with a stern, I'm here. If you were that woman, might you wonder if you had made the right decision to commit your life to someone who was not ready to display affection toward you in public? Would you marry someone who was half-hearted towards you? Would you feel good about your coming wedding if your husband was uninterested or unaffectionate? The Lord wants us to serve him with our whole heart. God has feelings too. He expressed his love for us by manifesting himself in flesh and dying on the cross. He has offered forgiveness of sins and eternal life to those who believe. But true faith will include spiritual passion. According to Jesus, the first and greatest commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Yes. Many things in life do not work unless they are done purposely and powerfully. We have all learned to avoid sluggish chainsaws, dull knives, sleepy divers, uh, sleepy drivers, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and never eat pilots in haphazard relationships. <clears throat> Few of us will settle for careless surgeons, dirty restaurants, or inattentive babysitters. Yet many settle for a mediocre relationship with God. When it is the relationship we should be most careful and most passionate about. It demands total value, much like bungee jumping and skydiving. God will settle for nothing less so neither can we. Notice God does not reject anyone for lack of skill or gifting. His problem is not with status or performance. His concern has to do with one's attitude toward him. He is disturbed when someone puts confidence in things and accomplishments rather than in him. So believers do not have to worry about perfection or performance, but they do need to worry about sincerity. The Lord sums up his thoughts toward Laodicea in verse 17, when he warned, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. What are some protections God provides through the church to help us identify blind spots? You say I am rich and need nothing. You do not realize your true condition. It appears their self-sufficiency is what offered God, uh, excuse me, what offended God most. Revelation 3 and 17, when someone feels rich and in need of nothing, that person is deceived. It often takes a significant problem to remind us of our true state. 
like the millionaire who hears the doctor say, I am sorry. No amount of money can cure your disease. Or an athlete who hears the coach say, sorry, your injury is such that you will never play ball again. God wants to bless the lives of his people. But all their religious deeds, kind words, biblical education, accomplishments, or afflictions, or affiliations with God's, with good causes must never take the place of a dependent relationship with Jesus. Wake up calls may be painful, but they can be restorative. To admit complete dependency on Christ is the starting place. God called them to turn to him. Jesus was lovingly calling the church in Laodicea back to a genuine faith and a passionate relationship with him. In verse 18, he admonished them to buy gold, tried in the fire, and white raiment, and to anoint their eyes with sad. These pursuits, <coughs> these pursuits are the antidote to all the problems mentioned in the previous verse. The analogy of gold Tried and the fire is clear. Not everything that glitters is gold. That's right, right. In order to be genuine and valuable, gold must be purified using high temperatures and chemicals. How does God use life experiences to purify our faith? Buying white raiment speaks of purity as well. Later in Revelation 7, John described believers who made their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. The idea is that believers should settle for nothing less than a pure and genuine relationship with God. Revelation 19 and 8 says of Christ's bride, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, <clears throat> clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Finally, the Lord reference the Isaiah for which their city was well known. The Sabbath in Anathlogos to God's Spirit, which helps those who receive it to see more clearly. The Holy Spirit's unction, like the ancient Isaiah's, first, first marks with conviction of sin. Then heals. I think it's to say first starts. First starts with conviction of sin. Then heals. He opens our eyes first to ourselves and our wretchedness. Then to the Savior in his preciousness. A commentary, critical, experimental, and practical on the Old and New Testaments. The Lord wants to be the source we turn to for everything. Amen. So while our culture may value self-sufficiency, it is not as noble as it may seem. God's people would do well to admit they are weak and He is strong. The path to abundant life begins with humility and can only be traveled successfully if it is done wholeheartedly. Can you remember a loss, sickness, or tragedy that served as a wake-up call, reminding you of your complete dependency on God? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Hear my voice and open the door. Jesus ended his admonition in verses 19 and 22. Uh, excuse me, 19 through 21, with the Father, a reminder that he promised that those who open their heart to him and hear his voice will have fellowship with him and will ultimately overcome. On a practical level, what does it mean to hear his voice and open the door? God has spoken through a cathor, clitor, of vessels and means. <coughs> we hear his voice by God as uh, being willing to be directed 
corrected or motivated by his word, whether written, spoken, or imparted, these words can come through any of the senses and through many modes, such as sermons, books, songs, and life experiences. Paying attention seems to be the key. The Laodiceans were so sure of themselves and so passive that they were not quite paying attention. When God knocks on our door by speaking to us, we can open the door to him by being willing to receive his word. This requires humility and submission, yeah. self-sufficiency and apathy block the heart's door from being open. In a very practical sense, to open the door is to yield to conviction, to be quick to repent, to be willing to change behavior, and to be responsive to the promptings of the Holy Ghost. While flesh will balk at some of the things, opening the door will take believers places in God they cannot get to any other way. Enjoy fellowship with the Lord. Jesus promised the way of the sins. If they would adjust their attitude and open up to him, he would suck with them. In almost every culture, breaking bread with someone is one of the most intimate forms of fellowship. How sweet it is to enjoy a Thanksgiving feast with the family or to take time to enjoy fellowship at a church picnic. There is something comforting, comforting about eating and fellowshipping with people you trust and love. Yeah. Is your relationship with God such that you look forward to daily fellowship with Him? Fellowship with God is available to those who set aside time to pray, relational prayers. This amazing fellowship begins with recognizing our total dependency on God. There is a freedom in relying upon God for everything and then just enjoying his company as we pray. When we are completely sold out and transparent, we have nothing to fear and no reason to run from God's word. Vulnerability makes it possible for personal prayer time to be passionate and open. We must open the door of our lives and choose unbroken fellowship with Jesus. Those desiring closeness with Jesus might find it helpful to treat God much like a married person would treat a spouse with whom they wanted a deeper and closer relationship. A marriage, a marriage counselor might advise them to set up daily meetings, plan dates, and work on being responsive to, to their spouse's personal needs. Their advice would <clears throat> also probably include the admonition to put their spouse first and not try to change them. Furthermore, something would probably be said about less name and more information. What if believers put the same kind of effort into their pursuit of God in prayer? Closing the message this morning. Here are some practical suggestions as to what a personal relationship with God might look like. Make prayer first each day. Amen. Guard your prayer time and place. Pray conser conser con conservationally. Being honest with God about all your feelings. Plan personal prayer retreats, expecting positive feedback. Talk to God everywhere and about everything. Practically, as you rekindle your relationship with God, consider approaching prayer from a national relational angle. You might find your prayers including statements to God similar to these. <coughs> How are you doing today? What do you want me to do in my situation? How do you want me to pray? 
Let me tell you about my struggles and fears. I won't feel what you are feeling and care about what you care about. I need you to wrap your arms around me and be my affirmation. The blessed hope we have today is that when we open our hearts to God, He will come in. Praise God. Amen. So that's today's lesson. Yes. Open the door.